Hi guys, just before we start the episode today, whatever platform you are listening to this on, whether it be on the podcast, uh, Apple podcast, YouTube, whatever it is, please support it. Please like, subscribe, whatever you can do. We want to reach as many people as possible. So please do that and we'll get right into the episode. Welcome to another episode of the Chronic Comeback Podcast. Today, I am really excited and happy to have on the show Carrie Rigoni. Um, I did ask her the name, uh, the, the correct pronunciation, and I did get it right first time, so I'm really happy with myself today. Um, just to give you a bit of a background on Carrie before we get into the episode. Uh, so uh, Carrie is a uh, chiropractor, applied kinesiologist, and vagus nerve educator with a special interest in treating the vagus nerve in children her own health story which we'll get into began when she was in chiropractic school eight years ago and she was diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome she then spent much of her 20s trying to search for help and trying to find the answer eventually finding integrative neuroimmunology to help heal her body and that was the, the healing path she went on for herself which you know we're going to get into. Um, this eventually lit a fire in her to not only support those with similar complaints, but also to help set children up on a, on such a uh, healthy trajectory that their brains would never experience that never ending fatigue and hopelessness that she had, um, which I think is super interesting because we haven't actually had, we have a lot of people on who turn into practitioners and help people, which is amazing. But we don't actually speak to many people who go back further than that so they can actually prevent it early on in life so I'd really like to talk about that but before we get into that let's talk a little bit well before we get into that how are you hello <laughs> hello thank you for having me no worries no you've got an awesome background that looks really cozy there uh this yeah. is my clinic actually <laughs> oh, very nice. it really yeah. for those who uh, are not watching this on YouTube it's very calming and um uh, yeah I, I'd say calming and cozy in your background <laughs> thank uh, you uh, yeah. <laughs> I would, I would definitely feel at ease if I was in that background. Um, anyway, <laughs> sorry, I'll stop digressing. Um, so, yeah, so if we could just go back to, like, the beginning of your story, um, before, uh, yeah, before chiropractic school, what was life like before then health-wise? Were you always someone who had kind of issues? Were you always completely healthy? Looking back on it now, could you see, like, uh, you know, telltale signs that maybe something wasn't right? Um, you know, it's kind of uh, twofold for me when I look back on my childhood because, you know, firstly, I was um, like, a, I guess, a perfectionist type A personality overachiever. I studied a lot. I did a lot of sport. You know, I tried really hard at everything, probably to the detriment of my health without knowing at that point, you know, you just keep pushing, pushing. Um, so, Yes, I was well, I wasn't unhealthy that I was aware of, but looking back, I can kind of see the signs of someone who could potentially turn into someone who burns himself out. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the other thing that uh, took me a long time to acknowledge was that I, I guess I would call myself like a highly sensitive person and I was never given any tools to learn how to cope with that. So when I felt things, I felt them massively. And um, I don't think I was really around anyone who was highly sensitive and could even understand my point of view. And it was always stop being so sensitive, you know, yeah, you're worrying about nothing and those sort of things. So I think on an emotional level, um, not having any tools to be able to cope with the stresses in my life that I perceived as stress were um, they kind of accumulated with time. And, you know, I created this story around myself, which was negative around how sensitive I was. And mm -hmm. um, it was never, never seen in a good light. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I guess if you're constantly told that at a young age, you're trying to suppress it every single time. Right. And the, that's, that's part of the like negative self-talk that you must have had from a young age. At what at what age did you recognize or were you told that that was like an issue for you? Um, I think my entire childhood, I was just being told that I was just highly sen too sensitive, um, you know, stop worrying about it. So it was it was a constant pattern for me. 
unfortunately. And, you know, it's just, again, the people that I was surrounded with didn't have the tools either, you know, like it's just the reality of, um, yeah, but it certainly opened my eyes when I got older and acknowledged that, you know, this is actually part of my personality. I could then, you know, have empathy for those people who also didn't have the tools. Are you from uh, Western Australia originally? Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I don't want to generalize, I guess, but, but from what I know, it isn't, isn't it? It's kind of, that is the kind of mentality, old school, just, you know, put, you know, pull your, pull your bootstraps up, just get on with it. You know, don't, I don't want to hear about it to get on with it. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. <laughs> Very much so. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, sorry to any Western Australians there that I've offended. Uh, but uh, there's a lot, there's a lot of other great parts to, to, to be in there. But, um, Okay, that's really interesting. Um, If we could go then taking it into the uh, the initial part of your your health story, um, what happened then and like when did you, at what time in your life did that, did stuff start unraveling and what was it specifically that you first noted? Mm -hmm. Um, So it was kind of a gradual progression that turned into a really big kind of shake up you know, like I wasn't getting the subtle messages being sent by my body. So it ended up with me being in hospital. Um, And I was in fourth year chiropractic school. So that was uh, about 15 years ago now. And so, you know, the higher achiever in me was trying to get the top marks in the whole class and study. And, you know, in your early 20s, you're going out on the weekend. So I was very sleep deprived. Um, very much bought into the culture, um, which is ironic given I was studying health, but, you know, into the culture of um, under eating because I didn't want to get too fat and, you know, all of that stuff. Um, And one weekend I had the worst abdominal pain I've ever had in my life. Um, And I went to the hospital and they could find nothing wrong with me. Um, but what they did do in the meantime, just in case is, you know, pump me full of antibiotics and steroids and all of, you know, let's just shotgun, see what we can do to get this pain away. But, you know, in the same sense, they were also like, well, there's really nothing wrong with you. So, you know, maybe it's just some anxiety or, (laughs) you know, like I had two ends of the spectrum happening and I just kind of left the hospital, like what, like what just happened? Um, but I was, I was never the same person after that experience. Uh, I got chronic fatigue syndrome, so I started sleeping. Um, you know, like I would sleep 16 hours a day. I would wake up, push myself. I'd have like a massive coffee, push myself to do some Cairo school, go to my classes, go home from 11.30 to 2.30 to sleep and then get up, have more coffee to push myself to go back to classes. Um, just to get through uni and you know my grades dropped and um, you know my friendships changed and everything because nobody really understood um, what it felt like to be just so tired but um, you know it didn't matter how much I slept it just um, it was never restful it was never a rejuvenating sleep so yeah it (laughs) <laughs> I think it's there's something that's um, it, quite about like sick about my personality that I've just got like an unbelievable amount of respect about how much you pushed yourself in that in that in that <laughs> time of your life like to, to be able to do that um it just resonates with me like I, when I look back at some of the stuff I did in my 20s it was so stupid but also just like I had like a got like goals and I just wasn't willing to I mean, I don't respect it in a lot of ways because it's like you're just not putting your faith self first at all, right? You're putting your goal ahead of your own health. Did you have anyone like warning you? Did you have anyone saying, look, this isn't good for you? You need to take a, a step back. No. And, you know, the the reason that I think I pushed through is similar. You know, it's that um, like that this is my goal and I'm going to get to it. Mm. Um, but also that like childhood priming of like, you're overreacting. Don't be ridiculous. You're fine. <laughs> like, you know, it took me actually a few years to truly acknowledge how bad it was because I was just stuck in that same self-talk cycle of like, Carrie, don't, you know, don't be silly. You can do this. Like you'll get through, you'll sort it out. Um, yeah. 
Did, did you ever, I, I had this habit and still do actually a little bit, but I used to be a lot worse where I would, I'd see a point in the future where I would have hit my goal or, you know, there'll be an intense period of time where I'm like, okay, well, I really, I won't put myself first in that period of time, but eventually then I'll take a rest and everything will be good. And, and that time just never came. Uh, did you, yeah. did you have that? <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It, yeah, and, and it's, uh, I think it's, yeah, unfortunately, I still do that to an extent now. I'm just realizing stuff about myself now. Anyway. <laughs> um, so, so when that was happening and you were, you know, you were doing those crazy night time, you know, getting up and all of that, what was, when was the, the straw that broke the camel's back that you were like, your body was like, you haven't got a choice in this anymore, you know, you have to stop. Um, it probably didn't hit me until I graduated and started in the real world and realised that, oh, this is not just stress from uni, you know, this is something. Mm -hmm. um, and being in the profession I was, you know, I, I would say that I had quite a bias towards um, thinking that some chiropractor would be the one to help me get better so I think I, you know, I did see some chiros um, in the area, but it wasn't until I kind of realised, I think, you know, I think there's more to this. Um, I had a, I was working in a clinic where I said to my boss, you know, I, I can't work these hours. I'm really struggling with this. I just need to rest. And, you know, I'm not any good to my patients if I'm not well, because I'm just not giving them my best. And he got quite grouchy about, me being um, a privileged new grad who didn't want to work for their money and, you know, like just all the old school mentalities. And I think it was, you know, around that point that I was like, okay, something's got to give because this culture that I'm embedded in is not conducive to my healing. And, and what were your, at that point, what we, could you just give us like a little bit of a rundown of like what your symptoms were like on a day-to-day -day basis? And was it, was it 24 seven? 24 seven fatigue. So I just, um felt I constantly felt like I had the flu and you have those muscle aches like you just can't move your body um I felt like gravity was so strong that I couldn't get out of bed so you know I, ha I had a pet dog at the time the park from my house is probably um was about 200 meters I used to have to drive my dog to the park for him to run around because I couldn't cope with walking that far without needing to have a nap afterwards. So I just had no capacity to even go for a walk. So um, I, I was just exhausted all the time, mental fog, you know, then it, I think that stuff infiltrated into my mental health um, I wouldn't say the mental health started it, but, you know, it definitely has an impact with time. And how did that impact your, your like relationships at that time and your not, not necessarily romantic relationships, but you know, if so, but like just all friendships, family, did you have people that were really understanding with the majority of people kind of distant? Like how, could you talk us through a little bit about that? Um, yeah, look, I think I hid it a lot from my family. I had moved out by that stage and um, I don't know if it was because I didn't want to be told that I'm, you know, <laughs> being too sensitive and overreacting and stuff. I didn't want to have to deal with that. Um, so I hid it. I hid it from a lot of people. Um, and I think the problem with chronic fatigue and some of these issues is you look kind of healthy, <laughs> you know, there's nothing external that says, hey, like I feel like absolute rubbish and I've slept for 18 hours and I still feel crap. Um, so I kind of got away with it a little bit, so to speak. Um, it definitely put a dampener on my friendships. I had one friend who understood and who went out of her way to support me despite how I felt or, um, made sacrifices in her life because she knew that I wouldn't be able to cope with um, whatever the, the um, you know, catch up or whatever was expecting of me. Um, but for the most part, I would say I lost most of my friends through the experience. Yeah, it's just a common, I ask that question quite a lot. And it is, I guess, 
you, you, I guess you, you, you kind of find out who your your closest relationships are in the, in those in those scenarios. Uh, yeah, it's just quite sad uh, that, you, that anyone has to go through that. With with when you were um, trying to find out what what was wrong, were you going to the traditional doctors? Uh, did you have to go and see multiple ones? Like, how did you actually get to that diagnosis? Yeah. Um, firstly, I went through the traditional route, like while I was seeing some chiropractors. Um, then I started seeing a doctor who, like just a family doctor who, you know, um, did a bunch of tests for a period of time. Um, I had random tingling through my body that would come and go. So he was like, let's just, you know, rule out all the MS and all of the different pathologies that can present in different ways. And um, you know, of course, every test under the sun was clear. Nothing ever came up on my blood tests. Um, so then I started kind of Googling. I think I, I self-treated a lot because I quickly lost trust for people who could help me. Um, and in Perth, uh, look, our, our community is growing. I think knowledge in general is growing. But at the time, there was one naturopath in all of Perth who dealt with chronic fatigue. And I can't say I saw any change with what he prescribed. I gave it a good hot go. And there, there was one GP, a functional doctor, who specializes in chronic fatigue and um, again it was like this weird dynamic where I would do all this googling and then I would go to my appointment and be like hey I've read about this what do you think and he would be like yeah give it a go and I was like well <laughs> I didn't need to pay you for that like you know I'm kind of seeking your expertise so um to be honest, I didn't start getting anywhere until I moved to Melbourne. Right. Okay. And what, mm -hmm. what it, it was that just because uh, Melbourne, there was a lot more people uh, like functional doctors and stuff in Melbourne. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so who, who did you have to see a few different doctors before you got to the one that was, yeah. Could you talk us through that? Um, so I saw a couple of different, um, there's a, like a clinic called NIM in Melbourne. Um, it has a bunch of different like specialty doctors and they all have their own, um, yeah, specialty. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, you know, it was figuring out um, gut stuff versus brain stuff, you know, like all of that. So I saw a couple of doctors there and we did, you know, stool tests and every test under the sun. And, you know, just by that time, I'd met the criteria for the chronic fatigue diagnosis, um, which, to be honest, I, I don't even know it off the top of my head anymore. Um, how cool is that, though? Um, but I think it's, you know, unexplained fatigue for two or more years. And there's like a bunch of things that you have to check off to get that diagnosis. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Yeah. OK. And when you got that diagnosis, was it? Because I think people are quite often searching for that label, and then when they get it, then it's like, okay, well, what do I do now? Like, how did that feel when you actually got that diagnosis, or did you kind of already know? I feel like I already knew, and um, I'm not a labels person. I had, I never bought into the label. Um, my my question was always why, like, why is my body doing this? Like, what is it adapting? away from or towards or like what is going on like why can nobody tell me why my body is so tired like this is not normal for a 20 year old mm. to have to either need so much sleep or live on caffeine um just to get through a day and then it's not a quality of life right it's just um it's just existing um so it didn't bring any kind of relief or um, validation. Um, I think it just made me more frustrated with the medical profession. So I kind of went down a more alternative path from that point onwards. Yeah, I think that's a, it's a very healthy way to have approached it. I think uh, a lot of people get that, get like a, a diagnosis and they, and then they're, then they're like, okay, well, they cling to like any sort of treatment that is associated with that 
Whereas someone could be given a diagnosis of what I've realized over the course of doing this, someone could be given a diagnosis of chronic fatigue. Someone could be give, given a diagnosis of Lyme disease and the cause could be the same thing. Um, and yeah, I think it's a, I guess that was maybe, do you think it was maybe your background having, you know, I guess more of a, you know, a medical background, you had that kind of brain and about, you know, looking at the root cause. Yeah. And it was like, yeah, well, I know I'm tired and it is chronic. So of course I have chronic fatigue, but that's a big umbrella, as you say, yeah. like why, what, how does that help me <laughs> putting a label on my medical record if you can't actually help me get over that hump? And at, at this point, when, when, when would you say was your, your lowest point if you, could, if you could picture that? Honestly, I think my lowest point was when I left the hospital and I was, you know, gaslit and also given all that medication and felt awful and they were just like, wiping their hands, see you later, like, you'll be fine now. Um, yeah. It was such a shock to the system. Yeah. yeah. And could, how, because a lot of people who are listening to this right now are probably potentially in that situation or at least feel like this is their lowest moment. How did you, and I think someone's actually asked, I, I've asked for some questions recently for a Q&A for myself, but someone asked, like, how do you keep going when you feel so help, hopeless and, and helpless? So how did you keep going in, in, the, in, that, in that instance when you were at your lowest? Um, you know, at the time, I, I did so many positive affirmations um, and really worked on my belief system. Even, you know, when my body was, felt like it was failing me, like I used to say, I just feel like a prisoner in my own body. I can't. I feel like I can't even sit up today. I just need to lay down. But the one thing I could do is work on my mindset. Um, so I, yeah, I would Google affirmations or like Pinterest or like whatever um, and just find ones that really resonated with me. And if I felt super crap, I would just say them to myself over and over. And I think at that point, it's almost like having that, time to lay down in bed and not use my body really helped me reflect on how I got here you know mentally like my childhood experience of me being sensitive and the people I surrounded myself with and just my outlook on life and all of the traumatic things that I potentially had not processed yet I think I actually really innately just started going through things and releasing some of that emotional baggage that I'd been holding on to for no reason. Mm, okay, okay. And, and do you feel like by doing that, you started to maybe mentally feel a little bit more motivated and stronger to like keep going and trying to get to the root cause? Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. But, you know, in saying that, I spent every waking hour that I had energy trying to find my root cause. I spent, you know, pretty much sleep google sleep google i i did not waste a second and that's probably the overachiever coming out in me just like really trying to i you know i needed i needed at that point complete healing i needed it to be 100% perfect <laughs> yeah. as opposed to this spectrum so i um yeah i spent a lot of time researching as well do you think there's a, um, so I've had a lot of conversations with people on the show recently where a lot of people become obsessed, me included, with fixing themselves. And in, by doing that, we're saying to ourselves that we're broken. And then it kind of starts this vicious cycle of, of, you know, of your symptoms. And then you're telling yourself you're broken, et cetera, et cetera. And, and then I think there's a, a lot of people that say, like, you need to accept your situation but there's a fine line between accepting it by saying I'm giving up and between saying, look, I accept that this is what's happening right now, but I'm aiming for better. Did you find, you know, what you said there, it sounded like you were obsessed with like fixing yourself. Did you feel at times that that was, could kind of make things worse? Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. 
um, it became, well, I suppose with limited energy, it became the, one of the only things that I would do in my spare time. It was a hyper fixation. And, mm. um, you know, I tried everything to no avail. You know, <laughs> like if, if there was a supplement, they were like, oh, this will help fatigue. And this is why I'd be like, sold, I'm done. I'll try that. Yeah. You know, like literally everything to find that, um, yeah, I guess that closure of yeah. that chapter. Yeah. Right. And, and you, so you, you said you started to see um, more of a more functional people in uh, Melbourne. Um, and so where where was it when you started to, you know, I mentioned when we first started speaking that, you know, you, you discovered like the vagus nerve and, you know, th- things around that. But when did you start discovering that stuff? And when did that actually start making a like a bit of a uh, an impact for you? Yeah, it was such a... Um like a serendipitous moment. I asked in a group, um, like a Facebook group. Um, I think it was a chiropractic Facebook group. And I just said, look, I'm, you know, (laughs) fed up with not getting any help from my doctors. I'm giving it one last go. I think at that point I'd kind of been on the round robin. I'd seen everyone natural and I was running out of options. And I was like, I'm going to, um, do one more call out. Maybe there's a doctor I haven't heard of. And um, someone said, hey, go see this Cairo. Um, You know, he does this neuro, um, integrative neuroimmunology. Like he's amazing. If anyone can help you, it would be him. And um, I never looked back. Like it was the best choice, the best decision that I ever made. So could you could you tell us what that is? Because I, I before I actually said those words earlier, <laughs> I'd never really heard of. I've heard of maybe neuroimmunology, but I've heard of a lot of terms uh, over the last like decade. So could you tell us what that actually is, and how then how how did that help you? Yeah. So this particular um, technique is a, an applied kinesiology technique. So it was created by a, a, an applied kinesiology chiropractor. And it was, he actually created it. He's like a a genius. He created it to help his own health because he also had chronic health issues. Mm -hmm. And um, the crux of it is, it is moving through every body system and how it also integrates with the nervous system. Because I think, you know, all of the approaches up until that point that I'd learned were very biochemical. Nobody had ever said, um, you know, we need to work out what your nervous system is doing at the same time and put them together. Mm -hmm. Because if your nervous system is dysregulated, then it's going to use nutrients differently. You're going to digest differently. It doesn't matter what you eat. Um, So um, he just like read all the science, pushed it together and it just, um, yeah made this technique that is just amazing so what so what what could you give us some detail on what the technique actually is um well apply do you know what applied kinesiology is so i've actually um i went to see a kinesiologist i traveled to florida um and it was but it was around um so obviously like muscle testing and stuff uh and it was but it was actually trying to understand like what I'm deficient in certain areas of my body and then ended up giving me supplements to help me in that, that area of my body. But I I don't know, is that, is that similar or? Um, yes, sort of similar. So, um, in neuro, um, integrative neuroimmunology, you would still get a full neurological exam. Um, and your, um, but we look at the client from a functional point of view. So there might be subtle things happening in your nervous system that is, they're not pathological. So a medical doctor would be like, you know, that's fine. But what they do is they give us a window into what's happening inside that person's nervous system. So then what we do is create a plan around that and work out how that actually is influencing either the immune system or the digestive system. And Ultimately, the end result is that um, the vagus nerve works better. The nervous system feels safe. You start Your nervous system starts to feel safe in your own body and in your external environment. And when you get that working better, then your prefrontal cortex starts activating, which is, you know, all of our higher centers and the brain fog starts disappearing because we can think clearly. Um, 
So I guess it's like a step-by-step -step process that you go through to unwind this stress response or um, chronic patterns that have been created in the nervous system and release them as well as supporting the biochemistry alongside that. Um, and so what, what are you actually doing to stop those? Because um, we, we talk, had a lot of guests on the show talking about um, like limbic system dysregulation uh, and <clears throat> like using brain retraining to kind of interrupt these uh, negative thought patterns that that keep you in fight or flight I'm doing a probably terrible job of explaining that but um what are you specifically doing to stop this kind of uh negative cycle within the nervous system so for the most part it's using the body it's how the body integrates and moves so um yeah. you know there's certain um we know that the nervous system requires appropriate movement to stimulate um, to stimulate it. So um, ensuring that certain movements are being done properly, ensuring that primitive reflexes have been integrated um, the way that they're meant to, um, a lot of work on the jaw. Um, ultimately, it's a full body um, experience. So the first half is quite passive in that the practitioner does a lot of work on the body and that releases a lot of that nervous tension and gets a person more comfortable, um, more like their nervous system feeling safer in their body. Mm -hmm. And then after that, it becomes more active, you know, and we actually work through that stress response. I've definitely got some more questions on that, but in terms of your, um, your personal experience, how quickly did you then start to make improvements and what, what kind of improvements were there? Yep. Um, I, I would say within 18 months, I was healed. Wow. 18 months. Yeah. And, and that was a, I imagine a kind of up, down, like. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So some days where you thought maybe this isn't working and then other days, you know, you shoot, shoot right back up. Um, okay, cool. And that was um, actually, that was 18 months and having my second child. I already had a child as well. So. Wow. 18 months while being pregnant and giving birth. <laughs> wow. Uh, I've yeah. got a lot. You know, I said I had loads of respect for you before. I've definitely got <laughs> a hell of a lot more respect for that as well. That's like, uh, yeah, God, I was actually speaking to someone the other day about, uh, yeah, having children whilst going through this. And I said, I, I've actually spoken to quite a lot of women on this podcast who have managed to have children and still recover whilst doing it. And I just think, that's such a motivating thing to anyone to hear that you can still have one of the, probably the craziest times in your life and still heal alongside it. And I think that just shows how strong and healing the body is. Um, and I guess maybe it gives you even more motivation to get it right, right? Because you've got these like crazy little children taking up all of your time. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, okay. So just, I want to ask more questions, right? So because... Again, I've had a lot of people on the show recently that have talked a lot about kind of the power of the, like the mind body stuff. And I've, I guess I've come to the conclusion myself because I've focused so much on physical stuff in the past. And now I'm trying to focus on a combination of addressing mental, emotional side of things alongside physical stuff. Do you yeah. get people who try to do this technique where they kind of just sit there and hope that it's just done all for them with the physical stuff, but then if they haven't addressed, like, uh, you know, because I think you kind of uh, 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 talked about it earlier, like your, I guess, stuff you've been told, maybe trauma that you've had in your childhood and stuff like that. Did you not need to address any of that as well? Um, it comes out. It just comes out. I... Um... The beauty of the vagus nerve um, is that, you know, if you are holding on to that stored trauma, when you start upregulating it, if you're doing it in a way that your nervous system is actually starting to make gains, mm -hmm. it, it literally just comes out. There's, there's always, um, there's one appointment where I think about 60% of the women who come through end up crying and saying, I don't know what you've done, but I like I just feel the need to cry and get it all out. So it's just this unspoken trauma that is just released from their body that then, you know, a lot of times they still need to um, work on 
their, you know, any traumatic experiences and stuff. And I do work alongside um, some beautiful psychs and counsellors if people need that Mm -hmm. Um, or referring over to, you know, a somatic psychotherapy type thing if they feel like they need um, that additional trauma response support um, because that's definitely beyond my scope. But a lot of people, um, I think by the time they've found me, have... um, they've probably been, you know, tired for so long that they've also, you know, processed a lot of these things or they've learned about their inner child and they've learned about all that stuff. But they're like, I know all this stuff and I can work on it, but I can't get over the hump. And that's kind of where I come in and help them shift it from a physical point of view. And is it uh, something you need to do in person with someone or is it uh, you could do it on like on online energetically? Um, no, I need to do it in person, unfortunately. Okay. okay. Yeah. Honest, I'm kind of glad you said that. I kind of, I'm still a little bit like when people say they can do it energetically across <laughs> the, 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 the ether. Yeah. yeah well, cause, <laughs> only because I've done stuff like that before and I've just been like closing my eyes going, is this working? Um, mm. So, okay, that's pretty. So, in that case, I mean, people who are in different countries right now because we have a lot of listeners from Europe and in the US um, who can't make it across to Australia to like see you what kind of person would they need to go and see Um, and also can someone use this alongside something they're doing right now can it be like a complementary like technique yeah Um, most people who come and see me are generally also seeing either you know a functional doctor or a naturopath or they're seeing a dietitian they're probably like if they they've realized they have some trauma they're working with a mental health professional um, it's definitely something that can be done in conjunction um, the man who created the technique is Australian and as far as I know the only people who currently do this specific technique are in Australia okay um However, I am seeing kind of similar things come out, you know, online. It's not exactly the same, um, but I, you know, I think as a starting point, if you um, look for either, you know, an applied kinesiology chiropractor, but yeah. then again, you would just need to kind of ring up and see what their kind of focus is or their specialty is because they might be interested in sport or something else, you know um yeah that would be a good place to start oh, sorry what's the, the the actual technique name integrative neuroimmunology oh, oh it is it, that is that that is the the actual uh, technique now okay cool and um, i think to be honest and what this podcast is about is not necessarily although a lot of people watch it and like want to understand the specific technique that someone recovered by it's more just like letting people know there's so many different ways to skin a cat like you you're doing what you are doing is I you can I guess you can you know people are doing in other ways and it's just giving people that confidence that they can recover uh, and they can get better Um, um, in terms of your life now so how long ago was it that you said you were like kind of like fully recovered um three years three years ago and How's how has life been since then? Do you do you find some days when you're just like, I can't believe, you know, this my life is like this now? Like I, I didn't ever think I could get to this point. Um I think I've maybe some days, but I think I've been well for so long now that sometimes I actually forget how bad I was, to be honest. And I would say that I still have a real big propensity for burnout because I'm still a high achieving. Um, like my husband says, I work too much and he's probably right. Um, you know, when I study, I still study on top of that. I'm always looking for ways to, um, bring more knowledge to what I do. Um, so I, yeah, I would say what happens now is that if I have a day where I've pushed myself too hard and I can feel that bit of burnout coming, maybe my, my muscles start feeling sore. I've learned, you know, to recognize the signs that if I can't shift it quickly, I often say, like, I find myself saying to my husband, gosh, I hope it's not coming back. Like, I don't know how I did this every day. I like, I can't cope with with all of it coming back and it it doesn't like my nervous system is much more resilient but 
I think it, I've still got that fear yeah. that one day I'll be stuck in bed again and, maybe, you know, I can't be the mum that I want to be to my kids or whatever. Do, do you have any advice for people um, listening to this right now that want to maybe uh, experience, want to address the vagus nerve, uh, but obviously they can't come and see you or you know, they can't come to Australia? Is there a good uh, book, podcast? Is there something they can be just doing on it? I know with the vagus nerve, I think there's like different techniques you can maybe do like every morning or something like that. Is there any, any bit of advice you would give to people that they could do maybe for free or over a very small cost? Yeah, yeah. Um- Look, my biggest message about the vagus nerve is that it's um, it's the, the nerve in our body that keeps us safe. Mm. It tells the, the threat centers of the brain, you're safe. You don't need to maintain that stress response. And I think it's a missing link for a lot of people. And it is really quite simple to activate. So, um there's heaps of books on the polyvagal theory with bunches of exercises. You can even find blogs on it. Um, you know, I share a bit. I try and share as much free content as I can on my Instagram. Um, and I look at things through a polyvagal lens, which is the three stages of the stress response and um, share like some techniques on my Instagram as well. But yeah, looking um, at a book, there's a beautiful book called um, Polyvagal Techniques for um, for Connection or something like that. Um, and that's got a bunch of recip- um, recipes um, <laughs> to um, a bunch of activities to do. And I think it's um, like 50 activities or something in there. Um, and I would just say try a bunch. Um, mm. Some of them sound so simple that they can't possibly be helpful Mm. and I think sometimes the overachievers in us who are burnt out and you know now in this position are like nah nah that that can't you know it can't be that simple but I would just encourage people to try them all and just see if one just helps your nervous system system shift a little bit because we we can't heal our body if our body doesn't feel safe it's going to stay in that state that it's got us to because it, it already doesn't feel safe. So we need to create that safety. And so that's why the vagus nerve is so powerful because then everything else just kind of like slots into place and it's um, you're not working so hard to get the results. And just one, I know you've got to go. So uh, just one, I guess, bit of final, yeah, final question for me, like, what would be your kind of message of inspiration to someone listening to this right now? I know we kind of touched upon it earlier, but um, I guess it almost like speaking to your yourself, like throughout that period, like having the hindsight that you have now, maybe even a practical thing or, or just kind of just advice for someone, you know, going through this right now. Oh, that's such a big question, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Good other part two. Um, my biggest advice is trust your intuition and really tap into it I think a lot of the times our bodies are giving us the answer and we're just either ignoring it or we're just not attuned to hearing it but just tap in and listen to your body and you'll start see like you'll start getting the answers for everything that you need Awesome. And um, thank you so much for coming on and, and, and sharing your story. Uh, yeah, definitely. I'm going to be looking into a lot of what you've said today. So it's like really, really helpful, but just most importantly, just added to my, my belief in my own recovery. So uh, thank you so much for coming on sharing your story and, and thank you. Sorry if I'm making you late uh, to go. <laughs> um, but yeah, I really appreciate it. Um, so thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you for having me.